problems where you have to find centripetal force or use centripetal force can be very challenging. But I think that if I give you five examples of different situations where you have to find it, you'll be able to use these examples in solving problems, because most of the centripetal force problems that we do in physics fall into one of these categories. I'm just going to go through these five examples one at a time and explain what's going on in each, why the forces that are present are what they are, and how they're related to each other mathematically. Before we begin, I want to look at an interesting pattern that shows up in horizontal circles and in vertical circles. If the circular path of your object is perfectly horizontal, that means that the net centripetal force is also perfectly horizontal. So this means that all y components cancel out. So whenever you're dealing with a circle that's happening in the horizontal direction, you know that all the forces in the y direction are going to cancel, and all the forces in the x direction are going to constantly add together to equal the centripetal force, which is equal to mv squared over r. So you can use that math to find what the sum of the forces will have to be. And if the circular path of an object is perfectly vertical, the net force or centripetal force can be vertical or horizontal, but it always has to exist on the plane of the circle itself. So a circle is two-dimensional, and the force always has to exist on that plane. It can never point outside of it. Those two facts are going to be really important for problem solving and in helping us thinking about these situations. The first three situations are going to be about horizontal uniform circular motion. We're going to start with something simple. Let's say that you have an object resting on a horizontally spinning surface, and we want to understand what the centripetal force on the object is. I'm going to start by drawing a free body diagram of this person standing on this spinning surface. I know that the force of gravity is always present, and because this is a surface and the person is not accelerating in the up or down direction, the normal force must perfectly balance out the force of gravity. Because they're spinning horizontally, there must be some constant horizontal force pulling them toward the center. In this case, the only place where that horizontal force can be coming from is from friction because the only thing that can apply that horizontal force to the person is the surface. So if the surface is applying a force that's parallel to the surface itself, that must be the force of friction. So we know that the force of friction is always pointing in toward the center of the circle, which kind of makes sense. If you're standing on a spinning surface, your feet have to physically stick to it to continue to spin. If it's slippery, you're just going to fly off the spinning surface. So making a force table for the centripetal force, and again, the centripetal force is just the net force on this person. It's not a type of force. The centripetal force in the x direction must equal mv squared over r because it's a horizontal circle, and in the y direction it must equal zero because it's, again, a horizontal circle. All the vertical stuff must cancel out. So that's how we know that the force of gravity and the normal cancel out, and the only thing happening in the x direction is the force of friction. So I can see here that the force of friction is going to be equal to the mass times the velocity squared over r. So if the problem were asking for any of those, I could use properties of the frictional force to calculate those additional values. Let's say now that I give this person something to hold on to as they spin around. So they're holding on to this bar as they spin around the circle. If they're holding on to this bar, that bar is helping them stay in the circle, and that would be the applied force that they're applying there because they're holding on to the bar. So because they're applying that force on the bar, the bar is applying the same force back on them, so I would call that the applied force. So we can see now that there are two forces pointing toward the center of the circle. There's the force of friction and the applied force, and they're both adding together to make mv squared over r. So this is what the free body diagram would look like. But m and v squared and r didn't necessarily change in this problem. I'm going to imagine that the circle spins at the same rate that it did before. So if those didn't change, then the sum of these two forces has to be equal to what it was before, that same mv squared over r. So that would mean that these two forces, connected tip to tail, have to be equal to that original sum of the forces, which means that the force of friction is going to have to be much smaller here than it was before to make those two things add together correctly. So this kind of makes sense. If you're holding onto a bar as you're spinning in a circle, the applied force is kind of helping out the force of friction, and your feet have to do less work pushing back against the surface to keep you moving in a circle. So if you hold on, it's easier to continue to move in a circle because your feet require less friction. So if you have a bar and you don't just have the force of friction, then you have both the force of friction and the applied force pointing toward the center. So the sum of those two will equal to mv squared over r. And you can get additional information out of the problem that way that you can then use to solve for missing forces. For example, if you had a way of calculating the centripetal force and you had a way of knowing what the applied force was, you could use those two to calculate the force of friction. So now let's go on to the next example. Again, I'm going to unpack the forces that are present here and how they're related to each other mathematically. I had already expressed in a previous video that when a car is turning, the force that's making it turn, the centripetal force, is the force of friction, because that's the force that the road pushes horizontally against the car with. And if there were no force of friction, if the road were icy, as an example, 
the car would just skid off in whatever direction it was going and it wouldn't be able to turn. So the force of friction here is acting as the centripetal force and is equal to mv squared over r. Making a free body diagram of this car, I have a force of gravity going down, a normal force going up, and a force of friction constantly pointing toward the center of the circle like this. So when I make my force table, this is what shows up. The normal force is pointing up, the force of gravity is pointing down, and it's not accelerating up or down because its net force points toward the center of the circle, which is horizontal here. So the force in the x direction is just equal to the force of friction, and that's mv squared over r. So that's how you would understand the relationship between the forces on a turning car. I'm going to change the situation a little bit here now. This is a really common problem in IB physics specifically. I'm going to now imagine that the road that the car is on is banked, which means that it's angled in a way to help the car make the turn. So the car is now sitting on an angle as it goes around the circle. This is a very common trick designers use to make it easier for things to turn. For example, NASCAR tracks are banked in this way where they're at an angle so the cars can more easily turn around them. And a lot of school running tracks are also banked. And runners find that when they're on that bank, it's much easier to make the turn than if the track were perfectly flat. So why is this? What force situation is causing it to be easier for this car to turn when it's on this bank? Making a free body diagram of the situation, I can see that I'm going to have a force of gravity down, that's always the case, an upward normal force. And I know here that the net force has to point straight toward the center of the circle because this car is trying to turn perfectly horizontal. It's not trying to get higher or lower on this banked road at all, it's just trying to turn in a circle. So its net force has to point toward the center because it's the centripetal force. So the net force has to be perfectly horizontal. The only force here with a component pointing in the direction of the net force is the normal force. If I break that up into its x component and its y component, this is what it looks like. Um, if you do the math, you'll find that the angle of the ramp is actually equal to that top angle of the normal force. So this is equal to the normal force times cosine of the angle, and this is equal to the normal force times sine. I'm going to take these now to my table so I can understand how they're related to each other. In the vertical direction, I can see that I have the normal force times cosine pointing up, and the force of gravity pointing down, and those two things are adding together to make zero. And I know that they're adding together to make zero because if this is a horizontal turn that the car is making, there's no total vertical force because the net centripetal force also has to be horizontal. So the normal force times the cosine minus the force of gravity has to equal zero, so those two things are actually equal to each other. In the x direction, I can see that the only thing that's happening is the normal force times the sine of the angle. So this normal force must be the centripetal force on the object. If you write this out, you get that the centripetal force is equal to the normal times sine of the angle is is equal to mv squared over r. So that's some interesting information that we can get out of banked road. On a banked road with no extra friction helping the car out, the normal force times sine is equal to the centripetal force, and the normal force times cosine and the force of gravity cancel each other out. This is notably different from a ramp problem that we've been doing in the past. There are a few different reasons for this. The main one is that in a banked circular motion problem, the centripetal force has to point perfectly horizontally because that's the direction that the object is turning. But in a ramp problem, the centripetal force normally points down or up the ramp, so it's at an angle. So if the net force is pointing down or up the ramp, that's normally the situation where we tilt the axis to make it easier. But here the net force is not pointing up or down the ramp, it's pointing perfectly horizontally to keep the object moving in a circle, and so the relationship between the forces change. This means that in a banked circular motion problem, the purely vertical forces cancel each other out, whereas in a ramp problem, you still have some vertical and horizontal component of your net force if you don't tilt the axis. Another notable difference is that in a ramp problem, the force of gravity is greater than the normal force because the normal force is equal to one smaller component of the force of gravity, whereas in a banked circular motion problem, the normal force is greater than the force of gravity because the force of gravity is now equal to just one component of the normal force. Moving on to example 3, this will be the last example for objects spinning in the horizontal direction. This is an example of tension at an angle. We're going to imagine that we have a ball attached to the end of a wire, and the wire is angled in a certain way, and it's spinning around in this horizontal circle like this. So you're normally given some angle like this, and you're asked to find information about the ball based on its motion. One thing you'll notice is that if this is the length of the rope, the radius of the ball's path is actually going to be equal to the length of the rope times the sine of the angle of the rope, because that's the opposite side of the right triangle that's formed when I draw that radius. So if you need to find the radius of motion for your equations, that's how you'd find it, the length of the rope times the sine of the angle. This is a free body diagram for the forces that are on the object. It's just the force of tension, and the force of tension always points in the direction of the rope or wire that's creating it. And then there's the force of gravity, which always points straight down. And there's no other force on this object, so these are the only two forces that are present. 
To understand why this object is moving in circular motion, we can break up the force of tension into its y component and its x component like this. I'm also going to move the angle over here because that's a similar angle to the vertical, and I can use that to find missing information about my x component and y component. So I can see that my y component here will be the force of tension times cosine, and the x component will be the force of tension times sine. So to understand the relationships between these, I just plug these back into my table. So I know that in the x direction, the net force will equal the centripetal force, mv squared over r, and in the y direction, because it's not turning in the y direction at all, the net force will equal zero. There are two things happening in the vertical direction here. There's the force of tension times cosine up, and the force of gravity down, so those two things must add together to make zero. And in the x direction, the only thing that's happening is the force of tension times sine of the angle. So that is going to be equal to mv squared over r here. So again, I can use this equation to find missing variables, and I can also use this equation to find missing variables. It really depends what information you're given, but this information you can draw out of that circular motion situation, given the table and your understanding of what will add together to make the net force. Okay, two problems left. Part two is on vertical uniform circular motion. So these are examples of objects that are moving in circles in the vertical direction. A really common example is a hill in a trough. You can see here that I have a car going over a hill, and this is actually an example of circular motion if we consider the hill to be part of a massive circle. Obviously the car is not actually going to go around this full circle, but as long as it's on a part of the circle, and it has a constant velocity, it is technically in circular motion. The radius of this full imaginary circle is called the radius of curvature. So if a problem tells you that a hill has a radius of curvature of so many meters, what it means is if this hill were extended into a full circle like this, this would be the radius of that full circle. Let's look at the forces that are present on the car. The only two that need to be present are the force of gravity down and the normal force up. And I'm going to assume that the normal force is smaller than the force of gravity, and the reason why I'm assuming that is that I know that the net force always has to point toward the center of the circle. And here, the center of the circle is straight down from the car. It's at the very top of that possible circle. So the net force has to be pointing down, so the force going down has to be bigger than the force going up. When I add these two forces together, like this using vector addition, I get the net force. I get the centripetal force on the car. So this means that when an object is at the top of a circular hill as it's going over with a certain velocity, its net centripetal force is going to be equal to the force of gravity minus the normal force, and it's also going to be equal to mv squared over r. A lot of problems might ask, what is the maximum speed that the car can go over a hill and still be in circular motion? So what that means is that if I increase the speed of this car, you'll notice that because the centripetal force is equal to mv squared over r, the centripetal force will increase when the speed increases. And the more the centripetal force increases, the less normal force you're going to need to add together to make that. And it can continue to increase like this until it hits the force of gravity. There isn't any other force pushing down that can affect the car, and the force of gravity can't get any bigger because it's just determined by the car's mass and the acceleration of gravity on Earth. So because the force of gravity can't get any bigger, this is the maximum net force down that you can have on the car, and so this means that this velocity, where the net force is just equal to the force of gravity, is where the car is moving at its fastest velocity. The car achieves its fastest speed if there is no normal force at the top of the hill. So if the centripetal force is just equal to the force of gravity, that's where the maximum speed of the car occurs. So that's kind of physics code. If there's no normal force, that means that the velocity is at its highest, and if the velocity is at its highest, there's no normal force at the top of the hill. Now let's imagine that the car is in a trough that's at the bottom of an area like this. Here I know that the normal force is going to be bigger than the force of gravity, because the net total force has to point toward the center of the circle. And here, the car is at the bottom of its circular path. So the force going up has to be bigger than the force going down, and I can't change the value of gravity, but I can change the normal force. So the normal force has to be bigger than the force of gravity. And when I add these using vector addition, I can see that this will be equal to the centripetal force. So in a trough at the bottom of a car's circular motion, the centripetal force is equal to the normal force minus the force of gravity, and those are also equal to mv squared over r, so you can use those equations to find additional information. Okay, this is probably the most complex example, example number five. Um, if you can master this one, you're basically going to be good for the rest of the unit in terms of circular motion. So, objects can go at constant velocity around a loop-de-loop -loop like this, and as they go around, we're going to need to understand what forces are acting on them to make that net centripetal force. So I'm going to have this car go around a few times and just fill in what information I know about the car. I know first of all that because it's moving at a constant velocity around the loop-de-loop, -loop, 
the net centripetal force has to be the same value at all locations and always has to be pointing toward the center of the loop. So if I make this go around and I choose three points to look at, at these three points, this is what the centripetal force looks like. At the bottom, it's going to be pointing straight up. On the side, it's going to be pointing to the left. And at the very top, it's going to be pointing straight down because it always points toward the center of the object's motion. Now let's have it go around again and see what the force of gravity is doing at each point. I know that gravity always points straight down and doesn't change based on the location of the car. So these are what the forces of gravity look like at each point along the car's motion. Okay, now that I have the force of gravity down and I know what the net force has to be, I need to decide what can I add to the force of gravity to make the net force point in that upward direction. And here at the bottom, the only thing that can be pointing straight up is the normal force. So that means that the vector sum of the normal force pointing up minus the force of gravity going down is going to be equal to the net force pointing up. So using vector addition, I'm going to start at the tip of the force of gravity and draw that normal force all the way up to the top of the centripetal force. And I know that the red and blue vector add together to make the purple vector. So the normal force has to be bigger than the force of gravity on the bottom in order to make this work, in order to make the centripetal force point in that upper direction. Because that purple vector is the vector sum of the two other vectors working against each other to create that single purple vector. Looking at the second point, I need to decide what forces are present here. First of all, the only force that can be pointing toward the center here is actually the normal force again. Because the normal force always applies at a 90 degree angle to the surface that's creating it. Here, it would apply outward from the surface because the surface is pointing up and down, so the normal force can point left or right. Here, it's pointing left straight into the circle. And because there's no other force present to push the car into the center of the circle, the normal force here has to be equal to the net force. And because the normal force is equal to the net force, that means that there can't be any vertical forces here. So if there's no net vertical force, there has to be some force in the upward direction preventing the car from slipping down as a result of gravity. So that force is actually going to be friction holding the car up, allowing it to continue its motion. So the force of friction here is balancing out the force of gravity going down. Okay, going up to the top, I can see here that the force of gravity is not yet big enough to match the centripetal force. I drew the centripetal force a little bit bigger. So that means we're going to need an additional push down, and the only thing that can provide that is again the normal force, because the normal force always applies at a 90 degree angle to the surface that's creating it. So here it's pointing straight down toward the center of the circle. Connecting those tip to tail, those two vectors add together to make the net force there. So that's what a force diagram would look like at each point along the loop-de-loop. -loop. So at the bottom, I can see that the centripetal force is the normal force minus the force of gravity. On the side, I can see that the centripetal force is equal to the normal force, and gravity is equal to the force of friction. And at the top, the centripetal force is equal to the value of the normal force plus the value of the gravity. There, they're pointing in the same direction, so they're working together to create that centripetal force. Okay, I'm now going to ask, what is the smallest velocity that this car can go around the loop-de-loop -loop with and still make it all the way around in circular motion? So I need to figure out what is the smallest value that the centripetal force can be as a result of the velocity. So I've put that equation above my head, you can watch what happens. As the velocity begins to shrink, the centripetal force begins to shrink as well, because the velocity is in the numerator, so less velocity will mean less centripetal force. Watch what happens to each of my force diagrams as the centripetal force shrinks. Because we can't change the value of gravity, we have to change other forces to make the sum of the forces equal to the centripetal force. So I'm going to play this animation a few times. Watch what happens as the centripetal force gets smaller. So the minimum that the centripetal force can be is the force of gravity, because at that top point, if the centripetal force got any lower, that would mean that the force of gravity somehow got lower than it actually is. And we can't change the force of gravity because that's only dependent on the object's mass and the acceleration of gravity. So we can't make that net force any smaller than it actually is. So that means that if the velocity got any smaller than where it's at now, the car would just fall off toward the top of the loop-de-loop. -loop because the actual force on it, the force of gravity, would be greater than the centripetal force that it would need to maintain its circular motion. So the minimum velocity that the car can go is determined by when the centripetal force is equal to the force of gravity at the top of its motion. So when a problem asks what is the minimum speed an object can go around a loop, it really means what velocity will make the net force equal to the force of gravity. That's physics code for that situation.
At the bottom, you'll also notice some other interesting patterns. You can see that because the centripetal force is equal to the force of gravity at the top, it also has to be equal to the force of gravity at the bottom, but because they're pointing in opposite directions, the normal force actually has to be two times the force of gravity to create that centripetal force. So the centripetal force will be equal to 0.5 times the normal force at the bottom. It'll be exactly half as big as the normal force. On the side, the same situation will hold. The force of gravity will be equal to the normal force at that point because the normal force is equal to the centripetal force, and we can see at the top the centripetal force is equal to the force of gravity. So because normal is equal to centripetal and centripetal is equal to gravity, normal is equal to gravity. And on the top, the centripetal force is just equal to the force of gravity and the normal force is equal to zero. And again, this is only true when the velocity of the car is at its minimum possible velocity to create that centripetal force. That was a lot. Um, if you didn't completely understand that, um, it's okay. You're going to have a lot of practice with this and a lot of chances to experiment with it. I would suggest coming back to this video as you go through the problem set, as you're having trouble, um, and referring back to some of the examples. Once you master these basic examples, every other circular motion problem is going to be some iteration of these basic situations.